Go ahead. Thanks. <laughs> anyway, um, we're very excited to introduce um, our speaker tonight, uh, Valentina. And I'm not sure how to pronounce your last name, Valentina. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Um, she is going to talk about light pollution and on and how it affects the behavior of birds. And we all know there's a lot more added light in the night skies right now. I mean, they're all using those solar lights, they're all lighting up a lot more uh, buildings and homes. And uh, birds really are affected by light pollution. So Valentina is gonna talk about how light does affect birds and what we can do to help create a darker night. So welcome Valentina. Um, and we we'll look forward to your hearing your program. Thank you so much for having me. I'm I'm really excited to be here and to get to talk to everybody. I love these hybrid things because it just means that more people can can attend. So um, before I get started, I have a lot of information I'm probably going to cover. Um, it's not going to be a super long talk, but I, I do go through a lot of things. So please feel free to comment in the chat whenever you have a question and you know when you're thinking of it in the moment and then at the end I can get to all those questions um and yeah I guess I'll just get started um yeah my name is Valentina so I'm a uh, postdoctoral researcher at the University of Nevada Reno and some of what I'll be talking about today uh, is my research and stuff that I've um, done for my PhD work um, and other other of it is just things I'm excited about and things I've learned along along the way. So what is light pollution? This is, I think, something we've all experienced in some shape or form. I know I have, especially living in Reno. Um, and it's it's really something that we've all kind of grown accustomed to, I think. We've gotten used to it. But imagine being a bird in this kind of environment. So birds are particularly vulnerable species, I think, to light pollution for a few reasons. I think first off, they are mostly diurnal species, which means they are sleeping at night and awake during the day, kind of like we are. And so this light pollution is particularly disruptive for them, unlike maybe mammals who are awake anyways during the night. They also often will nest out in the open, like if you can see this guy here up in the top left. And so uh, vulnerable to light pollution at night, um, because of that. And there's a ton of birds living in our cities. If you've ever tried to go on an urban birding trip, you probably agree. You can actually find a surprising amount of species just right in our backyards um, where we live. And a lot of species have, have become really used to it and are living here year round, or they'll use cities as stopovers during migration, even if they aren't here year round. So we have um, a ton of species living here with us in these light polluted environments. And it's not just the birds that are living in the cities with us that are affected because light pollution is really good at leaking outside of the cities. It doesn't have the same kind of physical restrictions that some other kinds of pollutants do. It just like reaches far and wide. And so we're seeing sky glow uh, from cities being detected even as far as into our national parks and conservation areas. Um, and reaching as far as under the sea and, and affecting aquatic life, which is pretty crazy. Some of the first evidence that light pollution was really a problem for birds actually started way back in the early 1900s because there are records from lighthouses documenting how many birds would end up showing up at these lighthouses on a given night because they were attracted to the light. But nowadays, birds don't just have the occasional lighthouse to worry about. They have skyscrapers, you know, our houses, buildings, light pollution, and light at night has become extraordinarily widespread and abundant. And it's a particularly big problem for these migratory birds. Birds that are used to using moonlight or starlight to navigate and tell which way to go 
So we can tell from uh, some advancements in technology, such as radio trackers, where you put little trackers on birds and kind of watch where they go to migrate, that a lot of species are becoming disoriented because of light pollution. And many birds are traveling thousands of miles at a time, which takes a ton of energy. And so getting even just a little bit off course when you're, when you're undergoing such a big energetic kind of task can be a real disaster. I like to imagine what it would be like to bicycle across the entire United States from here to Miami, and then realize when you get there, you're accidentally like in New York or something. It would just be a complete disaster, especially because the climate is totally different if you go to the wrong place. Um, and so, shoot, this isn't what I wanted. Um, sorry guys, I think I need to restart real quick and just get the regular, get the rest of the slides up. Hold on one second. Okay, perfect. And so, uh, here we go. And so, um, like I mentioned, so the biggest issue I think is this, this migration uh, problem. And because there is so much light pollution, one of the biggest issues I think is we're getting that we see is birds running into buildings. And so I'm sure you've heard about the issue of bird collisions during the day, um, but because we have these lights on at night, we're also getting a lot of bird collisions during the night. And so this is a recent study that came out in 2021 that started documenting how many bird collisions we would get over the night. And what's exciting is that they found if we reduce just the light coming out of our windows at night from skyscrapers by 50%, so reduce how much light is coming out of the windows by half, then we actually get 11 times less bird collisions. So they're attracted to these lights and it's causing problems for orientation, like I mentioned, and, and navigating getting to the right place. And it's also just causing a big hazard, a big obstacle for them. Some other recent technologies that have allowed us to study these issues um, are these radio tracking things that I've mentioned, but also um, weather stations. So some of these big technologies like weather stations allow us to use remote sensing data to figure out exactly where the biggest um, risks are gonna occur across the nation. So for example, these types of weather stations can detect movement and they can tell uh, what objects in the sky are birds based on their speed because insects are slower and airplanes are faster. And so we can use that to figure out where the birds are migrating. And we can also use satellite data um, here at the bottom here to look at where there's the most light pollution. And so from that, we can gather like where might we have the biggest risks, where are birds getting most exposed and where can we target our efforts to kind of reduce the amount of light pollution out there. There's also really cool efforts uh, like MODIS. So I'm not sure if you guys may have heard of this before, um, but it's essentially a big collaboration where researchers in different countries can share location data. And we're getting really good info now about where and when the birds are migrating. And it's cool because it gives us insight into which species we might need to worry about the most. So aside from these really big scale problems, um, such as migration, where we see how the birds are struggling with light pollution, I'm also going to talk a little bit scaled down about the effects of light pollution within different species living in different places. So first, what about different species? What are the birds actually seeing? Is the light pollution that we see different than what they see? And there's a lot of variation in how birds and, and animals in general perceive light. So for example, we see colors of the rainbow, Roy G. Biv, 
which together makes white light because we have three cones, which are types of photoreceptors that detect blues, yellows, and reds. Birds have a whole extra one that detects UV. And this doesn't just add a little bit on the end of the rainbow, it actually combines with the other colors to make a whole bunch of colors that we can't even imagine exist. This is an artist's representation of what a plain blackbird might look like to other birds here on the right, um, or what eggs that look camouflaged to us might look like um, to another bird, just because of this extra cone and this crazy different vision that they have. And it turns out that bird vision is really diverse, depending on where they live or what they eat. For example, hummingbirds are really important pollinators for flowers, and they're much better at detecting shades of red than shades of blue because it's so important for them to find the just the right red flower. Another really good example of this uh, is my friend Hannah, who studies uh, seabirds at the University of Hawaii. And what she found was that deeper diving species are less sensitive to red hues and UV because that kind of light doesn't penetrate the water quite as deep um, compared to species that don't dive as deep. They have better vision in these areas. Um, and then there's nocturnal birds who, of course, are specialized for nighttime vision and are much more sensitive to very dim levels of light. So what looks dark to us, they can probably actually see fine. Um, one example is uh, these tawny owls who are a hundred times more sensitive to light than your average rock dove. And then one of my favorite species uh, these cave dwelling oil birds, when viewing the exact same scene, this oil bird will, will see an image that's 150 times brighter than just that tawny owl, which is 400 times brighter than what, what we can detect, which is insane. And it's been found that among nocturnal birds, um, for example, burrowing hours have had a lot of research on them. They'll choose roost sites closer to the streetlights and actually hang out at light sources, um, and even sometimes shift their diet to eat the invertebrate species that are living around the light sources. So in addition to all the different uh, diversity in the way that species vision is and how well they can see the light um, and how they might perceive light pollution differently, the second part of this question is, how does light pollution itself vary in different kinds of environments? Um, the environment can self can act as a filter. So essentially it can change the quality of the light that gets in, whether it's sunlight or artificial light. Um, for example, we can think about how the light in a forest like this would come through a canopy and, and some of those colors would get filtered. Well, weather can have a huge impact as well, um, especially in these urban areas where we have a lot of uh, light at night. There was one study done in Berlin, Germany, that showed when it's snowing outside and when there's uh, also when there's clouds, light pollution can be a thousand times brighter than just the same exact place with the same exact lights on a not snowy, not cloudy day. So the weather and the, and the conditions make a huge, huge impact. Um, and another study uh, found that, like I mentioned before, light pollution can reach the bottom of the ocean. Um, and again, on a cloudy day, this will increase by 35%. And even if the light you think that reaches the bottom of the ocean, this might not be a very much. Again, we have to remember that organisms have very different vision. So some organisms that live underwater in these very dark environments, living almost, you know, used to living with no light at all, have very, very good detection abilities. For example, there's these tiny crustaceans that can detect moonlight 
80 meters below the surface. And they use it as a cue to vertically migrate every single day. And so if they can detect moonlight that deep, you can only imagine that they would detect our bright harbor lights and, and things like that. But you might be wondering, why am I talking about fish? Why am I talking about aquatic animals in a bird talk? Um, obviously birds don't, most of them live underwater that I know of, um, but it does matter uh, what your food is doing. And a lot of birds eat aquatic animals. Um, and so this does matter. And in addition to affecting birds themselves directly, light pollution can change bird behavior by affecting its food. Um, there's been some research showing that artificial lights around harbors, for example, will attract seabirds and increase their feeding rate. And the same goes for, uh, for offshore fishing vessels and boats and things like that that are emitting light at night. And it really goes back to that original um, observations that we've shown with, with birds attracted to, um, to lighthouses. They're now being attracted to almost anything that's out there with a light on it, which is kind of a lot of things. Um, and so it's an issue for birds that will eat aquatic organisms. It's also a big issue when it comes to bird that, birds that eat insects. Um, if you have a porch light, then you probably know what I'm talking about. The lights that we put outside are huge attractants of insects. Um, and this for birds that have flexible diets, a lamppost has just become basically a 24 hour buffet. There's so many things to eat, um, but different insects will be attracted to different kinds of light. Um, so we need to pay attention to the, the color of light that is outdoors because you'll get different communities of insects and then attract different communities of birds. And some birds, you know, don't have flexible diets. They can't just take advantage of this, you know, 24 hour buffet that just opened up nearby. Um, they actually might be at a disadvantage because they're now competing for food that maybe isn't ideal for them. So if I like to relate this to if, any, if there are any vegetarians out there, it's kind of like being surrounded now by 200 fast food restaurants, but in reality, there's not really a ton of options. So the changes that we're making to our environment might benefit some birds if they're able to take advantage of those um, benefits, but they might disadvantage species if they aren't as flexible. So the take home message is that different organisms are perceiving light differently depending on the color of light, whether it be because they have different vision, different visual systems, or because they live under a tree canopy or they're um, under the water. And this is particularly relevant right now, thinking about the color of light, because a lot of the increases that we're seeing in light pollution recently have been from switching from old light bulbs that are high pressure sodium lights to LEDs. And LEDs are great. They're much more energy efficient. Um, however, they, because they're much more energy efficient, they tend to be a lot brighter. You can make them a lot brighter without, you know, spending more energy. And they also tend to come in this kind of white bright light compared to the older ones, which were much more yellow and soft. And the white light is, I think originally was thought to be advantageous because we can see better in that light. It's, it's much more similar to what sunlight looks like. And so it's, it's better for our vision overall. Um, but as we switch from these yellow lights to the white ones, it's important to think about how light will look in different environments and which animals are gonna be more or less affected um, when we change the color like that. And as bird conservation advocates and scientists, we also care how other types of organisms are affected because it can lead to a chain reaction in ecosystems. Um, if we're affecting plants and insects and fish and, and birds and the things that eat them. All this to say, while light pollution itself might seem like a simple issue, there are all these tiny details about different species and what they see and where they live and what they eat. Um, and so when we make decisions about using light at night, picking the color and location and brightness, those are all things that we need to think about. And this is kind of a tangent that I 
got really passionate about while I studied this because I realized it isn't so much an easy solution. There is just so much diversity out there in, in the organisms that are going to be affected. And we need to think about each specific one and, and how they might be infected and how it's going to change their lifestyles. And so now I'm going to talk a little bit about my own research and move from talking broadly about the general patterns that we're seeing in the wild to the responses that we see in individual birds. So why are birds affected by light at night? How exactly does this work? Well, if you can imagine this is this gray blob here is a bird brain. Light detectors exist in the eyes called visual photoreceptors. These are the same ones that give us color vision. So like I talked about before, um, we have, you know, red, blue, and yellow, and birds have this extra UV one. But there are also non-visual photoreceptors, other photoreceptors in the middle of the brain. And these are not involved with vision necessarily, but they do detect light. Kind of like plants also have photoreceptors to, you know, to detect sunlight, but they don't have eyes. Um, and now I get to tell you one of my favorite fun facts about birds. So these photoreceptors actually, some of them sit right here on the very top of the brain and very near the, the skull. And because birds, have very thin bones. Maybe some of you guys know this, maybe not, but I think it's super, super cool. Bird bones actually have a lot of air pockets in them. They're kind of hollow and it allows them to be really lightweight and fly without you know, having these heavy bones to lug around. And so because uh, these photoreceptors sit at the top of the brain and because the skull bones are very hollow, light can actually go right through the feathers in the skull and be detected by those photoreceptors. So that means birds basically know what time it is even when they have their eyes closed. This is why you don't see a lot of birds wearing hats because <laughs> they need those photoreceptors right on top of their heads. And when these photoreceptors detect light, they use it as a cue to tune the body's internal clock. So it basically tells the rest of the body, hey, it's morning time, time to wake up. And this clock controls things like the cycle of melatonin. So this is a hormone that goes up at night and down during the day. We have it too. It also controls the timing of behaviors. So for birds, this means waking up and singing in the morning, um, knowing when the days are getting longer and it's time to breed or migrate. Um, and this clock controls physiological processes. So the cardiovascular cycle, um, kind of like uh, the reason our blood pressure goes up in the morning and our metabolism starts cranking and gets us ready for the day. Um, it's all that timing of all those processes is thanks to this clock um, that detects light. And I say we, because it really is the same thing that happens to humans. Um, we are also diurnal. We wake up and during the day and sleep during the night. So very, very similar processes. But when light pollution disrupts this clock, it can lead to some physiological problems, such as changes in your metabolic cycle, blood pressure, cardiovascular system. It can lead to stress um, and other things that, that pose health issues. And we know this from actually studies on humans. So it's the same thing we see in a lot of um, night shift workers because they're awake during the night under these really bright lights, there's been a lot of research going into this. And we see things like cardiovascular disease, metabolic disorders, depression, um, all sorts of different kinds of pathologies. And a lot of it is due to this um, effect of light suppressing melatonin when it should be elevated at night. It's a really important hormone. So the simple way to put it is that light pollution throws off these cycles because bird brains and bodies are responding to light that doesn't actually mean it's morning. It's, it's kind of tricking our bodies. It's biologically confusing. So for my research, um, I study how light pollution affects their sleep and activity. And I 
do my research using zebra finches, which are really cute little pet birds. They're native to Australia, but now a common, a common pet. And so we have birds in a cage with this little automated perch that records all of their movement on a computer um, 24 hours a day. Which means I can track their sleep and see when they're awake and when they're not. Um, for example, this is a graph of uh, basically their nighttime activity. So you can see uh, in the beginning here, everybody's asleep. There's very little nighttime activity at all. But my uh, group that's under light pollution is in the blue and my control group is in the black. So in the beginning, everyone's asleep. But then as soon as I turn on that light pollution, uh, there's a lot more nighttime activity. So I can tell that the birds are more awake and they're getting less sleep. And then I also take a blood sample to measure hormones and monitor their health. So uh, for example, in the past, I've measured melatonin. Um, and this is a graph of a hormone called corticosterone, which is similar to cortisol, which we have, and it's involved with metabolism. And it's often associated with stress because it gets elevated when we are stressed or when we're exerting more energy than we need to be. And we found that the birds, um, under the light pollution have higher levels of this hormone after sleeping under light pollution for three weeks. Um, and again, these health effects are interesting to me because they are very similar to the effects that we might see in humans. It's not just night shift workers that um, are being affected. If living in Reno, this is kind of what my house looks like. There's like a huge street light just right outside my window. Um, and it's it's really bright. Even when I put the shades down, I can still see it. And so there's kind of nightlight everywhere. And I'm sure um, some of you guys will be able to relate to that. Um, and so I want to also mention, I guess now, I think I meant to earlier, but I forgot. The light pollution that I uh, study and, and what we use in our experiments and that what I'm interested in is really, really dim. So it's not necessarily the same as... Uh, you know, working the night shift and being under these really, really bright, constant lights. It's more similar to, you know, when a bird's living in uh, something like this, the city, or if there's just like one little street lamp outside, it's more common that the birds are experiencing really, really dim levels of light. And we're still seeing these kinds of effects that I showed you just now. Um, so I think even at really dim levels, there is suppression of melatonin and we're seeing these hormonal changes and behavioral changes. Um, and so I think it's important to study these dim levels because it's realistically what they're experiencing. Although there are some birds that will sleep directly under the street light. Most of them are roosting in trees nearby and maybe getting some of that light filtered through the leaves um, at more dim levels. And so now I wanna talk about what can we do as humans to minimize the negative effects um, on birds and wildlife, and also ourselves, like I said. Um, and I'm going to go through four R's that I like to talk about um, to help remember what some of the best strategies are. So the first one is replace. And I mentioned this briefly. Um, LED, maybe I forgot. <laughs> Sorry, it's a little bit late. So LEDs come um, in a totally in a range of colors. You might recognize this if you've uh, shop for light bulbs recently at Home Depot or something like that. The light bulbs come in this range of colors and they'll usually advertise them as like warm white or daylight or um, things like that. And so it's really easy to choose what color you want. And I did talk about this, um, how, how there's a variety of different uh, sensitivities in the colors that, that animals will see. And so picking the right color um, can have a big effect. And so uh, this is actually another part of my research. Uh, one of my first studies, I compared two different color temperatures to see if we would have um, different effects on the birds that we study. And I compared these to uh, a warmer and a cooler color temperature light. But I will also mention, like if, if you just look at these lights, they're very, very similar. And if the lights in your house were these different colors, you might barely even notice. When you go to Home Depot these days, there's a huge range of different colors that you can choose from like very, very orange to very, very blue and white. 
Um, so we tried to pick something subtle that was realistic and, and an easy change to make as a, as a customer um, to see if there was an effect. And so I exposed the birds to these different colored LEDs. Um, and what we found was there was a big effect. So if we use these warmer color temperature lights, we actually see that the birds are sleeping pretty much normally compared to this cooler, whiter uh, color light. And we also found that there wasn't any elevation in these stress hormones that I mentioned before for the birds that were sleeping under the warmer colored light, only for these cool ones. And the reason we found this is because the photoreceptors I was talking about before um, are more sensitive to this blue short wavelength light um, that the warmer color temperature doesn't have as much of. So to replace, my recommendation is just buy softer whiter lights instead of the cool white ones. At least for the birds that I study, um, this will make a big difference. And it should be an easy sell because it's actually probably better for us too. Our photoreceptors are very similar. And that's why you might've heard of these blue light blocking glasses. They're kind of all the rage nowadays. Um, and it's because of the same phenomenon, you know, that, that short wavelength light that is in very white lights uh, is more stimulatory for our photoreceptors and it's better at keeping us awake because it mimics sunlight so well. And so if we, by these glasses, we're protected, but if we buy light bulbs that don't have it, then wildlife is protected as well. One day they'll come out with the little tiny little bird glasses, but I don't think they'll be a huge hit in the wildlife scene. So the second strategy is redirect. And this is basically just making sure the light is going where it's intended and not anywhere else. So one example is using shields to put over the light so that it's facing, uh, the light's pointing downward and pointing at the sidewalk if that's what we need to see or the road, but not spilling out into the surrounding natural areas. Um, you, can, you can achieve this using vegetation barriers too. So if we, if we plant more trees or bushes around streets, for example, and kind of block a little bit of that light from getting out into nature, um, that can make a big difference. And then, I think one of the easiest, simplest solutions is just using curtains. So, you know, this is, I think, hilariously simple because we all already have them and I'm not even perfect at putting my curtains, drawing my curtains at night. Um, but if you remember that study that I mentioned before, if we reduce the lights coming out of our windows by half in cities, we can, we can achieve 11 times less bird collisions. So really simple. We already have them. Just use curtains and block some of that light that's spilling out of the windows. Um, ultimately, the best solution is really just to remove light. Um, there is some necessity in our modern day society. We need to drive. We need to fly planes. I don't think that's changing anytime soon. So those kinds of activities need light and and that's important, but there's a lot of redundancy out there. So extra lights where we don't really need them. For example, like I mentioned, there's a street light right outside my house and it's really, really bright. And I think we could probably cut the amount of lights on my road in half. People don't need porch lights outside of my house because it's already so bright. And we could even remove the street lights by half and it would still be pretty good visibility at night. Um, and if you live in a place like I do, like Reno, a lot of these are just advertisements. Um, but luckily, you know, Riso, Reno has also been going through a lot of uh, transition lately. There's been some opportunity to inform the city and maybe make changes for the future. So it's worth, um, it's worth pitching these kinds of ideas to your local governments because a lot of times cities already have plans to kind of modernize. And this is a really easy sell because like I mentioned, it's better for our own health and it'll actually save people money. Turning off lights is cheaper and more energy efficient. And if there is redundancy, if there's excess, then just cutting them by half will save everybody money and energy. And it's kind of a win-win. And when it's impossible to just take light out altogether, I think reducing is a really viable strategy. 
um, a good option. For example, we can we can think about the timing that we put lights out. So in Salt Lake City, for example, there's an initiative right now for businesses and residences to turn off lights during migration periods uh, and during uh, breeding, which is like March from March to May is breeding and then August to October. And that alone can make a huge difference because we're gonna avoid some of that, you know, the disorientation of migratory birds and some of the effects on uh, early development that can affect survival and population health later on. We can also use motion sensors. So this is a new technology, again, that's, that's actually um, been developed with LEDs. So while LEDs can be a bad thing because they're so bright and white, they're great because you can change the color of them really easily, you can get dimmers really easily, and you can get motion sensors, which will only turn on if somebody's right outside your house. So maybe have motion sensors, uh, an idea for cities is to have motion sensors where they lights will turn on when a car is going by, but maybe a simpler option is just to have those as your porch lights. So if somebody's at your front door, the light will turn on and you can see, but if nobody's there, it stays off. And then I think a really good idea is to think about the intensity of the light that we use and just dim them a little bit, um, especially during weather events like snowy days or cloudy days, that little bit of light goes a very long way. And so I think paying attention to the intensity of the light um, and just dimming it when possible can be a really good solution. And on a big scale, um, we'll even if you're just dimming it a little bit, like in an entire city, that will have a very big effect. And there are a lot of cities uh, starting to adopt reduction strategies. So this is a map of some of just some of the programs that exist nationwide called Lights Out. Maybe you've heard of some of this. Um, this is a sort of local example at the Golden Gate Audubon Society uh, just down the road. And it's essentially a program where building owners, managers, um, tenants work together to ensure that all unnecessary lighting is turned off, especially during peak migration events um, and breeding. And if you're interested in pitching this to your local community, um, I think it's a great idea. Again, it, it's, it should be an easy sell because it actually saves people money most of the time and energy. Um, and it's good for the, it's, it's one of the easiest solutions I think um, for cleaning up pollutants in our environment. There aren't many pollutants out there that you can say to someone, hey, we can clean this up by just flicking a switch, you know? And so if you're interested in this, uh, this website, the Golden Gate Audubon Society, they have a lot of really awesome resources like um, flyers and you can print out and share with people. You can get rebates for, uh, for installing light timers and motion sensors like I talked about. Um, and there's little tools to calculate how much energy you'll save and things like that. So they're really good selling points um, if you wanna help, help out spread the word. So these are the solutions to remember. Um, I just came up with this. I think it's, uh, you could come up with something else, but um, they're pretty easy for things to remember. And in the end, it's all about just minimizing the amount of light that's out there. But for my end of things, uh, as a scientist, I would add one more, and that's just more research. I think there's still so much to learn about. Um, one of my passions is just bird visual systems. Like I talked a little bit about, you know, like how well nocturnal birds are able to see and what colors seabirds can see. But there's so many species out there that we have no clue what their visual systems are like. Um, and so there's a lot more to learn. And and on the engineering side, I think there's a lot more great solutions out there that are yet to be invented that will help minimize light pollution and the impacts it has on our wildlife. And so that's all I have for you. Uh, thank you. And I would love to take questions because I, like I said, I, I went through a lot of things really quickly. So. All right. Oh, thank you, Valentina. Boy, you brought uh, a light to uh, a lot of information here about <laughs> how birds are affected by light and humans too, and what we can do about it. Um, I think we're all going to start going home right now and looking at our <laughs> light and trying to make uh, that adjustment that you're suggesting. And also, um, I was just amazed to think here we get these LED lights. And you know they're good for us, but 
they're not so good for birds. So here we go again as humans. <laughs> but yes, we actually do have quite a number of uh, comments and um, questions and in the chat. Yeah, so uh, let's see. Someone in the very beginning asked uh, what I meant by sky load. And I think I meant sky glow maybe, but it's um, it's what we call light pollution that is spreading really far. So it's it's not just the light that's coming out of a street lamp right outside your house, but it's what we call just ambient light that will reach way into forests and stuff like that. And it's detectable by satellite. So um, even when you think you're, you know, a mile or two outside the city, the the environment that you're looking at is technically still polluted by light because of a glow that's kind of um, reaching that far. Um, somebody asked, uh, when to Audubon Society asked, are birds attracted to light for the insects? And that is a very good question. I think it definitely depends on the species. So there are some birds that are attracted to light because of the light, because they're, they, they're used to using the moon or the stars as a cue. Um, and something about it just like attracts them. But I think a lot of them are becoming well adjusted to cities because it is offering this extra food resource. And so uh, if you are a bird that can take advantage of that extra food insect, you know, 24 hour McDonald's insect supply, then you're definitely gonna be attracted to that. And it will depend on the species based on what the cost and benefits are. are. So if, um, if they're benefiting a lot from that food source, then they're definitely going to be attracted to that food. And I think cities in general offer a lot of things for birds. They offer, you know, a lot of food sources, sometimes extra shelters, you know, we put bird boxes out. They're often warmer. So in the winter times, um, cities can be warmer based on like just cars and people and uh, the cement being warmer. And so all the things that we're bringing birds in for the light pollution is that can then be a byproduct, and then they're they're just coping with it because they're here for the food, you know, they're here for the food and the comfort. But as a result, they're also being exposed to light pollution, um, for sure. Oh, great! And there's still some great comments. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Um... And yeah, I'll I'll put up. Somebody asked what color light I recommend, and so I'll just leave this up here. Um, because these are the colors that I used in my research. And Kelvin uh, is the K here, represents Kelvin. So it's um, a measure of color temperature. And it's this number. So you can find them anywhere from 1,000 to 7,000. And 1,000 will be really, really orange. And seven will be really, really white and blue. And I found that 3,000 was, was enough to, um, to reduce the effects that I saw. and uh, it, it's not that yellow. So it won't like change totally the color of your lights anywhere. So I think that's a good choice. Um, and I'll just say, I, again, I don't, I think it's hard for me to recommend something overall because when I, when I, when you use a warmer color light, you might still be attracting insects and then you might still be attracting birds. Right. And so, um, it's hard to make like one, it's not going to be like the best solution. I think the best solution is just don't use light, you know, turn them off. But uh, definitely a better option than the than the white ones for sure than the very white or blue ones. Oh, that was great. Um, it is kind of crazy to go by light bulbs nowadays and the choices you have. So that was a great recommendation. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I don't see any more questions. A lot of great comments. Uh, wonderful program. Uh, we appreciate your time and effort and your studies. And um, yeah, thank you for having me. And if anyone has questions, here's my contact info. So please feel free to reach out if you have questions later on or um, ever want to contact me for anything. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Yay!
All right, and we'll see everyone next month. Uh, we're going to have a speaker talk about the greater sage grouse. So again, Valentina, thank you so much. Thank you. Good night. Yeah, you know, these programs just make you start thinking about.